The actuarial assumption here is stunning. I saw it with Francine, the Times of London, the new annuity rate 4.1% on a retirement annuity in the United Kingdom. Everybody's dealing with these low rates. Are you telling your executives that there's a permanence to these low rates and a new lower actuarial assumption? Uh, what I've been saying is that we're in a low rate environment probably until the next recession expansion cycle. So, you know, we can see a move up from 10 year yields, for example. You know, our expectation is 10 year yields will move up from current levels before year end. Um, but we really, you know, if we look at the world and we look at the world of negative interest rates and we look at the, the global stock of negative yielding debt, um, that something has to change in order for those yields to move higher. And that change probably has to be structural. Uh, so it's not just the fiscal response needs to kick in. It needs to be, there need to be labor reforms around the world. There need to be regulatory reforms around the world uh, that make the world a more productive right. place and then boost potential growth. It's like a separate story, but GE is moving from defined benefit to, I'm sorry, it's every retiree for themselves, a 401k. What's the actuarial assumption of a 401k given Mattis economics and Mattis market strategy to MetLife? Well, I, I Under think- Under 5%? I, 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 well, I mean, so the 401k is gonna obviously depend on what you invest in and, and how you invest. And I think, you know, when you think about, you know, what firms uh, like ours are going through what, and what, what all firms that, you know, utilize interest rates are going through is, you know, how do you maintain kind of a, a decent interest rate uh, on, your, on your earnings or on your investments uh, without taking the kinds of risks that you don't want to take? Um, and so that's been a, that's been something that we've been dealing with for years now, and, and unfortunately, because we've been dealing with it for years, we've gotten pretty good at it. And, and I think, you know, the, you can adapt over long periods of time. So it's the shocks that you have to worry about. It's mm -hmm. what would happen if interest rates spiked higher by two or three percent, you know, in a year? Uh, higher interest rates are better, uh, but if you're not prepared for that move, you, you have to worry about it. So, you know, because it's been such a long-standing issue. Uh, firms have had the chance to adapt. It doesn't make things easier, right, but it means but Drew, that you've been able to manage things. Is it, isn't, it get, isn't it getting much, much worse? I hear so many people saying, well, actually, maybe it's the time to go to cash. And so I guess for every person that decides to go to cash, you have someone deciding to go into a risky asset or riskier asset in the search for yield. And is that the biggest concern for the next financial crisis? Uh, I, you know, so if everyone's sitting in cash, that's not good. Right, we can both agree on that. The, the question is, though, uh, I have a lot of faith in the average in the average consumer, the average investor. Um, they're doing what's in their own best interest, and I think when everyone does what's in their own best interest, uh, sometimes you can get the better outcome. Uh, I, I think what we're seeing now, and what you see around the world, because this holds around the world, is that when interest rates are too compressed, people save more money. They're not incentivized. Um, you would think that they would not be incentivized to save money, but instead the response is for them to actually save more money as interest rates fall. Uh, and what that tells me is that this whole idea of staying at very low rates for very long periods of time that you see around the world with the Fed, with the ECB, with the Bank of Japan, uh, that is a policy that does not work. Um, and what you really need to do is, is move rates or attempt to move rates up to a level that minimizes the amount of savings uh, in, you know, in favor of consumption on the part of consumers. And for the U.S., we're well below that level right now. For the ECB in Germany, they're well below that level right now. And for the Bank of Japan, right. they're well but below Drew, that level right now. But, but do central banks really have a choice? Uh, they do. Uh, the, the greatest fallacy is that negative rates or that sustained low rates actually help an economy. They do not. They actually create zombie economies that create zombie firms that take productive people and put them into firms that shouldn't exist. Uh, and then we have a low productivity environment that leads to a low potential growth rate environment, uh, which then makes it look like you need to keep rates low in order to sustain growth. And that's just simply not the case.